ask that you would bless the live streaming, the DVD production. As we take up the study this morning, we ask that you'd forgive us of our sins, that you would uh, allow us to be in such a relationship with you that we can hear your voice, that your Holy Spirit can speak to our hearts, that he can have an influence that would change us more fully into your image. We want you to pour the latter rain out upon us by opening our understanding to your word. We ask that you do that for us at this time. I ask that you would overrule my humanity, that you would hide me behind your cross, that the ideas and the words spoken would be from the throne room on high, touched with a coal from off the altar, and that they would be words that would glorify and honor you, and words that, and thoughts that the Holy Spirit can use to help edify your people. We want to understand the mystery of iniquity um, to a level that we can recognize what it means for us as Seventh-day Adventists here at the end of the world, and we ask that you would open our understanding to this thing. In Jesus' name, amen. We're in our second section of considering Habakkuk's two tables, second section being that we're looking at these two tables as typified in the scriptures. Uh, we've developed the first premise to understand this by looking upon the reform lines, line upon line, proof texting, to show that all the reform movements parallel one another. And from that platform, we've been showing how these two tables of Habakkuk are a waymark in the reform lines. And we've been looking at some of the implications of this fact. But we said early on when we began the reform lines that some of the way marks of the reform lines, uh, before we finished off, we were going to look at them more closely. And in a reform line, we have the darkness that precedes the time of the end, and that darkness it represents several things. Then you have the time of the end. At the time of the end, you have a prophecy that's unsealed. All of these are way marks. Um, when the prophecy is unsealed, you have an increase of knowledge, also a way mark. Um, the message is understood and then empowered when a divine symbol comes down, another way mark. <laughs> then you will see the enemies of that history putting up opposition to the message. This is the second way mark. Um, then you see the empowerment of the second message, the midnight cry, the triumphal entry, the plagues of Egypt. This is a way mark that leads to the third way mark third primary way mark, the closing of the door. Judgment is followed by disappointment, followed by a work that's given to the people of God, followed by backsliding by the people of God, and then the fourth way mark. So we laid out those way marks of the, the reform movements. We took time in the spirit of prophecy to show that prophecy is illustrated on a line and that these way marks are to be understood and defended, that they would come under attack. Uh, we noted more than once in the Spirit of Prophecy that they have a specific order. So we put all those things in place. <clears throat> but some of those waymarks carry such uh, important light that you really have to step out <clears throat> and look at them more carefully to get the impact of them. And in the time period that precedes the time of the end, the darkness, um, you have in Revelation 12 that time period identified as the wilderness. Okay, so it's not only darkness, it's the wilderness. And in each of these histories, there's a voice that comes out of the wilderness. So you have to understand what the wilderness is in order to really understand what the voice is, the message for that time. But also in the darkness is where you have the mystery of iniquity. Um, and we want to look more carefully at the mystery of iniquity, although we have already noted it. Um, when we've developed the lines. In our previous presentation where we were de dealing with the mystery of iniquity, we, we took a passage from Manuscript Release, Volume 18, page 30 to 36. It has several paragraphs. This is where we're starting today, but I didn't, I didn't include the several paragraphs. I just want to take a few thoughts out of that passage, but for those of you that are downloading the notes or have the notes, you have the entire passage. Where we begin in this passage, it says, All need wisdom carefully to search out the mystery of iniquity that figures so largely in the winding up of this earth's history. So that's what we're doing here. We're, we're trying to exercise our human wisdom in connection with God's wisdom 
in order to understand the mystery of iniquity. But here she says we have to search it out. It's not something that's one of those jewels that's on the top of the ground. You have to search it out. And she says that it figures so largely at the end of the world. There is no middle path to paradise restored. The message given to man for these last days is not to be amalgamated with human devising. And uh, if you know what amalgams are in your mouth, um, it's when they take silver and they combine it with mercury to make the fillings in your mouth. And Sister White plainly tells us that mercury is a slow, insidious poison. So this word amalgam, if you know about dentistry, it seems like a pretty sinister word. You know, it's, it's combining a, a slow, insidious poison to make a different compound out of those two elements. That's amalgamation. And that, this is the mystery of iniquity. Um, it's combining God's word with human words. Those, who God, those whom God has exalted to high positions of trust may turn from heaven's light to human wisdom. That's amalgamation. All who would possess a character that would make them labors together with God and receive the commandments of God must separate themselves from the enemies of God and maintain the truth which Christ gave to John to give to the world. You have the definition of amalgamate, to mix or unite in an amalgam. Um, so the mystery of iniquity is the work of Satan in mixing truth and error. We have noted that earlier in our studies. Go to Genesis 6, 1 through 7. Um, where it is the classic big biblical example, one of them, of the mystery of iniquity. Verse 1 of Genesis 6 says, And it came to pass when men began to multiply in the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. This was the... Uh, the mixing of the righteous seed and the unrighteous seed. It carries, continues on in verse 3. It says, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is also flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. When this amalgamation, the mystery of iniquity, takes place here in Genesis, and the Lord sees it, that's when he gives them the probationary time. Now the testing process begins. And then in verse 4, it says, There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. See, what, produ what the mystery of iniquity produces is wickedness. And that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. This wickedness is identifying it's represented here by the imagination. Every imagination becomes wicked after the mystery of iniquity comes in. Verse 6, And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man, whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. So you can see in here that when it comes to the Lord identifying the probationary time that leads to the closed door, the closed door of the ark, to the symbol of all these reform lines. The time of the end, there's an increase of knowledge that's going to produce two classes of worshipers. The wise understand the increase of knowledge. The wicked do not understand the increase of knowledge. This illustration of the everlasting gospel, the very first one in the Bible, includes just a few characteristics. The closed door, the probationary time, the wickedness of the men, and defining that wickedness as their imagination, what's going on in their minds, in their hearts, and the mystery of iniquity. The mystery of iniquity, the combining of the unholy and the holy seed. Prof Patriarchs and prophets, comment on this passage, and what I'm going to do here <clears throat> is we're going to use we're going to practice William Miller's rules of prophetic interpretation. We're going to practice the line upon line of Isaiah 28. We're going to bring line upon line. We're going to do proof texting. And we're going to look at this phenomenon of the mystery of iniquity throughout several places in sacred history. And we're going to pull out the various <coughs> characteristics and develop a definition of this 
the history of the mystery of iniquity. So after uh, Sister White comments on Genesis, she says, for some times the two for some time the two classes remained separate. The race of Cain spreading from the place of the first settlement dispersed over the plains and valleys where the children of Seth had dwelt. And the latter, in order to escape from their contaminating influence, withdrew to the mountains and there made their home. So long as this separation continued, they maintained the worship of God in its purity. But in the lapse of time, they ventured a little by little to mingle. And I have little by little and mingle underlined because this is a characteristic of the mystery of iniquity that needs to be marked. After the lapse of time, they ventured little by little to mingle with the inhabitants of the valley. Their association was productive of the worst results. The sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair. The children of Seth, attracted by the beauty of the daughters of Cain's descendants, displeased the Lord by intermarrying with them. Why? Why did they see that they were fair? Were, were, was the righteous daughters ugly and the un unrighteous daughters beautiful? Is that what it was? No, it was that the unrighteous daughters no longer worried about modesty. And one of the lessons here is that modesty, immodesty in dress can even cause a righteous man to sin. And the daughters of the Lord in Adventism need to take that to heart. Because that's one of the lessons here, but that's not what we're dealing with here. The sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair. The children of Seth, attracted by the beauty of the daughters of Cain's descendants, displeased the Lord by intermarrying with them. Many of the worshipers of God were beguiled into sin by the allurements that were now constantly before them, and they lost their peculiar holy character. Mingling with the depraved, they became like them in spirit and deeds. The restrictions of the seventh commandment were disregarded, and they took them wives of all which they chose. The children of Seth went in the way of Cain. They fixed their minds upon worldly prosperity and enjoyment and neglected the commandment of the Lord. Men did not like to retain God in their knowledge, and they became vain in their imaginations. And their foolish heart was dar darkened. And w when Paul continues on in this passage, what does he call them? He says, their foolish hearts were darkened, and they became what? Reprobates. Yes, one other word. Reprobates. Fools. So these people that get this, this vain imagination and a foolish heart, they're fools. And the Bible says, call no man fools. I'm not trying to call anyone fool. I'm trying to tell you that this is the foolish virgins. Okay. That's in Genesis, leading to the flood. How about Abraham? <clears throat> Patriarchs and Prophets 173. Now, you'll notice, and those of you that are listening, unless you've downloaded the notes, you will not be able to follow this part of the lesson. But after I read about Abraham, then I'm going to start putting underneath the quotes the, very, very, the characteristics that we see in each of these histories where the mystery of iniquity is represented. <coughs> Abraham had marked a result of intermarriage of those who feared God and those who feared him not from the days of Cain to his own time. The consequences of his own marriage with Hagar and of the marriage connections of Ishmael and Lot were before him. The lack of faith on the part of Abraham and Sarah had resulted in the birth of Ishmael, the mingling of the righteous seed with the ungodly. The father's influence upon his son was counteracted by that of the mother's idolatrous kindred and by Ishmael's connection with heathen wives. The jealousy of Hagar and the wives whom she chose for Ishmael surrounded his family with a barrier that Abraham endeavored in vain to overcome. So these two passages tell us that the characteristics of the mystery of iniquity is mingling. It happens little by little. It creates vain imaginations, and it's accomplished by intermarriage. Signs of the Times, April 22, 1886. But the descendants of Abraham... Now we're moving further on into history. Departed from their worship of the true God and transgressed his law. They mingled with the nations who had no knowledge or fear of God before their eyes and gradually imitated their customs and manners until God's anger was kindled against them and he permitted them to have their own way and follow the devices of their own corrupt hearts. So a little bit further in history, <clears throat> we can add to that list of characteristics of the mystery of iniquity that they 
imitate the customs and manners of these people that they're mingling with, that they're intermarrying. Moving forward to the time of Moses, <clears throat> and this is sometimes not recognized about who the mixed multitude in the story of Moses are, but it says the mixed multitude had accompanied Israel from Egypt, were not permitted to occupy the same quarters with the tribes, but were to abide upon the outskirts of the camp and their offspring were to be excluded from the community until the third generation. So the mixed multitude is a different group than the Hebrews when they come out of Egypt. They can't even line up with them. And you can see the passage from Deuteronomy where this statute is put forth. It says, Thou shalt not abhor an Edomite, for he is thy brother. Thou shalt not abhor an Egyptian, because thou was a stranger in his land. The children that are begotten of them shall enter into the congregation of the Lord in the third generation. Okay, so this is the mixed multitude. But who's the mixed multitude? Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, 243 says, It was the mixed multitude that came from Egypt with the Israelites, who were the principal movers in this dreadful departure of, from God, the golden calf. They were called a mixed multitude because the Hebrews had intermarried with the Egyptians. Okay, The mixed multitude is a symbol of the mystery of iniquity. It's the intermarriage between the righteous seed and the unrighteous seed. And the mixed multitude is the one that causes all the problems. Okay, Pretty much. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 315. So, so what we've added to the, last, the, to the list there, well, we'll add it after this next quote is the category of people that promote the mystery of iniquity or the mixed multitude. During this period of waiting, <clears throat> they're going to receive the law here. During this, time, this period of waiting, there was a time for them to meditate upon the law of God, which they had heard, was first spoken to them, and to prepare their hearts to receive the further revelations that he might make to them. They had none too much time for this work, and had they been thus seeking a clearer understanding of God's requirements and humbling their hearts before him, they would have been shielded from temptations. But they did not do this. And, soon, and they soon became careless, inattentive, and lawless. <clears throat> Especially was this the case with the mixed multitude. Who's the mixed multitude? Half Hebrew, half Egyptian. Okay. They were impatient. Notice that. They were impatient. Okay, that's one of the characteristics of the mixed multitude. They're impatient. To be on their way to the land of promise, the land flowing with milk and honey. It was only on condition of obedience that the goodly land was promised them, but they'd lost sight of this. There were some who suggested a return to Egypt, but whether forward to Canaan or backward to Egypt, the masses of the people were determined to wait no longer for Moses. Feeling their helplessness in the absence of their leader, they return to their old superstitions. There, there's a characteristic for them. The mixed multitude is going to return to their old superstitions. And brothers and sisters, where I'm going with this, so you'll know in advance, is that I believe all the prophets are speaking about the end of the world. And the mystery of iniquity is an, an attack upon Seventh-day Adventists at the end of the world because the mystery of iniquity is the work of Satan in combining the unholy seed with the holy seed. And the holy seed at the end of the world is Seventh-day Adventism. So all of these lessons are coming down to Adventism. So somewhere along the line, Adventism returns to its old superstitions. I'll give you an example. William Miller was the first person in history to recognize and identify that the daily in the book of Daniel was paganism. But the Protestants at that time, they had variations, but the Protestants at that time basically believed the daily had to do with Christ's sanctuary ministry. So, in the 1930s, when we switched to the Protestant view, we switched to our old superstitions. Okay, it was always a superstition to teach that the daily represented Christ's sanctuary ministry, and the Millerites set that superstition behind them, but in the 1930s, we returned to our old superstitions. Now, I'm not dealing with the daily here. I'm just trying to give you the method that we're going to, the, what we're going to do with the conclusion of this study when it's all said and done. And I, and I want you, if you will, to be watching for these little indications as we go. The mixed multitude. Filling their helpless, helplessness in the absence of their leader, they returned to their old superstitions. 
The mixed multitude had been the first to indulge in murmuring and impatience, and they were the leaders in the apostasy that followed. Among the objects regarded by the Egyptians as symbols of deity was the ox or calf, and it was at the suggestion of those who had practiced this form of idolatry in Egypt that a calf was now made to worship a beast. They're going to make the image of the beast. The people desired some image to represent God and to go before them in the place of Moses. God had given no manner of similitude of himself, and he prohibited any material representation for such a purpose. The mighty miracles in Egypt and at the Red Sea were designed to establish faith in him as an invisible, all-powerful helper of Israel, the only true God, and the desire for some visible manifestation of his presence had been granted in the pillar of cloud and of fire that guided their host and in revealing his glory upon Mount Sinai. But with the cloud of the presence still before them, they turned back in their hearts to the idolatry of Egypt and represented the glory of the invisible God by the, by the similitude of an ox. Okay, so the characteristics we pulled out so far from this progressive history as we're coming down through sacred history the, the mystery of iniquity is mingling. It's imitating the customs and manners of the heathen. It's returning, once you've made a covenant with the Lord, returning to those old heathen customs and manners. It happens little by little. It creates vain imaginations in those that fall into it. It's represented by intermarriage. And those people that participate in it are the mixed multitude and they're impatient. They're impatient. Okay, what's their motivation? Prophets, Patriarchs and Prophets 281. And they went out about 600,000 on foot that were men besides children, and a mixed multitude went up also with them. In this multitude were not only those who were actuated by faith in, God, in the God of Israel, but also a fair, far greater number who desired only to escape from the plagues. So the mixed multitude... The, their big portion of the mixed multitude, they were going because of fear. They wanted to escape from the plagues, all right? Desired only to escape from the plagues, or who followed in the wake of the moving multitude merely from excitement and curiosity. For those of you uh, that are friends of ours and know where we live and heard that we had fires here on Friday, um, and if you wondered if we were close to the fires, a, a a professional baseball player could probably hit a ball from where I'm standing to our road. And where our road is, on the other side of it, they evacuated our neighbors on Friday night because of the fires. Okay? But my point is, is that there was people calling from this area and people from this area that were going out looking at the, the television networks and the fire trucks. They were there for what? Curiosity, okay? They were, they, seen the, they seen the children of Israel going out of Egypt. They'd seen all those plagues. They're going to follow along from curiosity. And then there was some that were following along because the plagues had made them scared, okay? This class were ever a hindrance and snare to Israel, okay? So their motivation, their negative motivation is fear and curiosity. It's not because they are... Um, convicted that the God, the God of heaven is the God that they should follow. And if you've thought it through, this is the foolish virgins. Because this is the same reason that the foolish virgins in the Millerite history came to the Millerite me meetings. Notice Great Controversy 391 and onward says, The coming of Christ as announced by the first angel's message was understood to be represented by the coming of the bridegroom. The widespread reformation of the proclamation of his soon coming answered to the going forth of the virgins. In this parable, as in that of Matthew 24, two classes are represented. Who are the two classes? Well, they're illustrated all over the place. You know, Hagar and Abraham, Cain and Abel. Uh, it's, it's the two classes that Satan brings together to accomplish the mystery of iniquity. 
dropping down now where she's going to describe the foolish virgins in this history. She says, others took their lamps and took no oil with them. They had moved from impulse. They're moving the same reason the mixed multitude moved. They had moved from impulse. Their fears had been excited by the solemn messages. Their fears had been excited by the plagues that were poured out. But they had depended upon the faith of their brethren, satisfied with the flickering light of good emotions without a thorough understanding of the truth or a genuine work of grace in their heart. They had gone forth to meet the Lord, full of hope and the prospect of immediate re reward. Yeah, I'll go to the promised land. But they were not prepared for delay. What's it mean if you're not prepared for delay? You're impatient. This group, the false to the foolish virgins, they're impatient. That's the mixed multitude. They were not prepared for delay and disappointment. When trials came, their faith failed. When Moses didn't come back, their faith failed, and their lights burned dim. While the bridegroom tarried. Now, when just so happens, when their faith failed, when Moses was gone, what was he doing? What was, how does the Bible explain that? He told his elders, tarry here till I return. It's the tarrying time of Moses that Sister White is now explaining the tearing time of the Millerite history, but it's, that, it's the same story all over again. By the tearing of the bridegroom is representing the passing of the time when the Lord was expected, the disappointment and the seeming delay. In this time of uncertainty, the interest of the superficial and half-hearted, this is one of the characteristics, superficial and half-hearted. Can you be half-hearted to the Lord? No. You're full-hearted, and if you're half-hearted, then you're no-hearted. You're either decidedly on the side of Christ or decidedly on the side of Christ, Satan. Okay? Half-hearted, that's one of the characteristics. But though the interest of the superficial and half-hearted soon began to waver and their efforts to relax, but those whose faith was based upon a personal knowledge of the Bible had a rock beneath their feet, which the waves of disappointment could not wash away. They all slumbered and slept, one class in unconcern and abandonment of the faith, their faith, the other class patiently waiting till clearer light shown, should be given. Yet in the night of trial, the latter seemed to lose to some extent, extent their zeal and devotion. The half-hearted and superficial could no longer lean upon the faith of their brethren. Each must stand or fall for himself. And so the characteristics we've derived so far mingling, imitated their customs and manners, returned to the old superstitions, it happens little by little, vain imaginations, intermarriage, in, the multitude is impatient, they're the foolish virgins who are mo motivated by fear and curiosity, and they're called half-hearted and superficial. In this crisis at Sinai when they made the golden calf, we want to put one thought in here because we deal with this later on in this series about the sons of Levi. Though God had granted the prayer of Moses in sp sparing Israel from destruction, their apostasy was to be signally punished. The lawless and lawless lawlessness and insubordination into which Aaron had permitted them to fall, if not speedily crushed, would run riot in wickedness and would involve the nation in irretrievable ruin. Now you think this one through. There are... We're saying this all comes to the end of the world. And what they're dealing with here is them worshiping the image of the beast. And in Revelation 14, the punishment for those that receive the mark of the beast in Revelation 14 in the third angel's message is they're going to drink the wine of the wrath of God that's poured out from his cup. And that's what Moses did. He ground that image of the beast into powder, mixed it with water, and made them drink it. Okay, This is an illustration of the Sunday law crisis. And the, the, Levites, the Levites are the ones that are on the right side of the issue. But if you think through that last sentence, you know, about why God had to punish them. It says, their, the lawlessness and insubordination into which Aaron had permitted them to fall, if not speedily crushed, would run riot in wickedness and when would, would involve the nation in irre, irretrievable ruin. In Adventism today, you have pastors that are teaching that probation doesn't close at the Sunday law. Yet the third angel's message is to go to the world and say, if you receive the mark of the beast, you're going to receive the wrath of God. You have to come stand upon the Sabbath truth. So if God doesn't close probation for Seventh-day Adventists at the Sunday law, 
than when the people are out there telling the third angel's message to those people outside of Adventism. If you're outside of Adventism and I'm saying, you either stand upon the Sabbath, brother, or you're going to receive the mark of the beast. Well, this Adventist over here, he's saying, well, no, that's not really true because my probation didn't close at the Sunday law. And because of convenience, I'm going ahead and I'm worshiping on the Sunday now, so I still have money to support my family. They get punished at the Sunday law. Probation closes at the Sunday law. The Levites come in right then and there and deal with the mixed multitude, or it would cause a, a crisis beyond what could be imagined. And I'm not, and I'm not saying Seventh-day Adventists die at the Sunday law. I'm talking about the close of their probation. But terrible severity, the e by terrible severity, the evil must be put away. Standing in the gate of the camp, Moses called to the people, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. Those who had not joined in the apostasy were to take their position at the right of Moses, and those who were guilty but repented at the left. The command was obeyed. It was found that the tribe of Levi had taken no part in the idolatrous worship. From among other tribes, there were great numbers who, although they had sinned, now signified their repentance. But a large company, mostly of the mixed multitude, that instigated the making of the calf, stubbornly persisted in, the re in their rebellion. Why? Okay. Patriarchs and Prophets 408. Why were the mixed multitude like that? One more characteristic to put into the mix. The mixed multitude that came up with the Israelites from Egypt were a source of continual temptation and trouble. They professed to have renounced idolatry and to worship the true God, but their early education and training had molded their habits and characters, and they were more or less corrupted with idolatry and with irreverence from God. Oh, Satan accomplishes the work of the mystery of iniquity through education. Okay. Let's move forward now to the time of Christ. No, this isn't the time of Christ. Sorry. We're still, we're not even close to the time of Christ. This is the bread of heaven. God continued to feed the Hebrew host with the bread rained from heaven, but they were not satisfied. Their depraved appetites, and this is one of the characteristics, they have depraved appetites. Their depraved appetites craved meat which God in his wisdom had withheld in great measure from them. Now, brothers and sisters, we're going to make an application that at the end of the world, the people in Adventism that are on the wrong side of the issue, they have a depraved appetite. And I'm not talking about physical appetite. I'm talking about spiritual appetite. Okay, they can't, they can't refrain from reaching out to Babylon to receive their spiritual messages. They have a depraved appetite. But notice what it says here, because this counters, this counters one of the arguments about these charts, about the daily, about the 2520. It says, their depraved appetites craved meat. Here's, you can put, if you put this into Adventism, they, they crave some profound and significant passages from the Bible. Because that's the meat of the word. The surface truths of the Bible, that's the milk of the word. But these, the mixed multitude in Adventism, they craved, they wanted some deep insight from the word of God, but which God in his wisdom had withheld in great measure from them. God withheld the deep stuff from the people, the mixed multitude, with depraved appetites, because he knew it would be a problem if they handled those kind of sacred truths. He withheld it? You mean, there is the possibility that God purposely withheld Ellen White from saying, James, you're wrong about the 2520. Does he withhold meat from us? Well, with ancient Israel, he did. Their depraved appetites craved meat. Which, in, which God in his wisdom had withheld in great measure from them, and the mixed multitude that was among them fell lusting, and the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to meat? eat? We remember the fish 
which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic, but now our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all besides this manna before our eyes. We don't like the bread of heaven. We don't like the message that God gave us. We, we want a deep spiritual message, but not that one. They became weary of the food prepared for them by angels. Which angels? The three angels' messages that came into history from 1798 to 1844 as represented on these charts. These angels brought this bread from heaven. They became weary of the food prepared for them by angels and sent them from heaven. They knew it was just the food God wished them to have and that it was helpful for them and their children. Notwithstanding their hardships in the wilderness, there was not a feeble one in all their tribes. Satan, the author of disease and misery. Look at the growth of the Adventist church. There was nothing stopping the rise of spiritual Israel after 1844 except spiritual Israel. Notwithstanding their hardships in the wilderness, there was not a feeble one in all their tribes. Satan, the author of disease and misery, will approach God's people where he can have the greatest success. He has controlled the appetite in great measure from the time of his successful experiment with Eve in leading her to eat the forbidden fruit. He came with his temptations to the first, he came with his temptations first to the mixed multitude the believing Egyptians, and stirred them up to seditious murmurings. They would not be content with the healthful food which God had provided for them. Their depraved appetites craved a greater variety, a greater variety, especially flesh meats. In our day, we see the power of the adversary upon the human mind. Many professing godliness openly transgress the law of God. In every congregation, there is a mixed multitude. Whoa, she just said, we have half Egyptian, half Adventist in every church. In every congregation, there is a mixed multitude. Those who claim to be righteous, while they do not those things that God has commanded, and are like self-righteous Pharisees. Now... She's told us that this mixed multitude, it's not simply the foolish virgins, it's the Pharisees, and they have a depraved appetite. Can you have a depraved appetite for spiritual things? Signs of the Times, June 26, 1901. As we receive physical strength from the food we eat, so we are to receive spiritual strength as we study the Word of God. It is as necessary that attention should be paid to the cry of the soul for spiritual food as that attention should be paid to the cry of a hungry child for temporal food. A neglect to supply the soul with the bread of life leaves it weak and strengthless, unable to do the will of God. The life of such a one is like a barren fig tree, destitute of fruit. Yeah, you can have a depraved spiritual appetite and long for the diet that comes from Egypt. Now we'll move forward to Joshua. Are you watching us going down through sacred history? This is an important one. The, the message of the mystery of iniquity and the time of Joshua, very important. I'll tell you out front. Joshua here represents Ellen White. Okay? Challenge me on that if you like. <laughs> The people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, who had seen the great works of the Lord. Their sins were repented of and forgiven, but the seed of evil had been sown, and it sprang up to bear fruit. Joshua's life of steadfast integrity closed. His voice was no longer heard in reproof and warning. In a 1915, Ellen White's voice was no longer heard in reproof and warning. His voice was no longer heard in reproof and warning. One by one, the faithful sentinels who had crossed the Jordan, one by one, the pioneers that had experienced the disappointment of 1844, laid off their armor. A new generation came upon the scene of action. The people departed from God. Their worship was mingled with erroneous principles and ambitious pride. When it comes to the mystery of iniquity, one of the characteristics is, is that Satan makes his move once the generation 
of those that were initially clean with the Lord have been laid to rest. How about Solomon? Moving forward. <clears throat> this is a very important one. Solomon is very important to this story. All right. Solomon knew that God had chosen Israel and made them the depository of the truth and sacred faith. God had erected a wise barrier between them and the rest of the world. And only jealously guarding the ancient and only jealousy guarding by. the what? And only by jealousy. Solomon knew that God had chosen Israel and made them the depository of the true and sacred faith. God had erected a wise barrier between them and the rest of the world, and only by jealously guarding the ancient landmarks. What's the ancient landmarks? It's the reform movement of 1798 to 1844. It's these truths. But this is Solomon. And only by jealously guarding the ancient landmarks could they preserve their high and distinct character. Why then did Solomon become such a moral wreck? He did not act on correct principles. He cultivated alliances with pagan kingdoms. He procured the gold of Ophir and the silver of Tarshish, but at what a cost. Solomon mingled error with truth and betrayed sacred trust. The insidious evils of paganism corrupted his religion. One wrong step taken led to step after step of political alliance. Dropping to the next paragraph. On the next page. Solomon tried to incorporate light with darkness, Christ with Belial, purity with impurity. But in the place of converting the heathen to the truth, pagan sentiments incorporated themselves with his religion. He became an apostate. God was no longer to him the only true and living God, a ruling providence. He was a religious wreck. In the days of Christ, the ruins of the groves erected by Solomon for his wife might still be seen. This place was named the Mount of Offense by all the true-hearted in Israel. Solomon little thought that those idol shrines would outlive his reign even till Shiloh came and looked upon the melancholy sight. This case is left on record for all the religious world. Let those who know the word of the living God beware of cherishing the errors of the world. These Satan presents in an attractive style, for he would deceive us and destroy the simplicity of our faith. If these errors are introduced... They will mar the precious landmarks of truth. Ah, oh, the mystery of iniquity attacks the foundations. It attacks the landmarks, the waymarks. Hmm. Ezra, moving beyond Solomon. Now they're rebuilding the temple. Very soon thereafter, a few of the men of Israel approached Ezra with a serious complaint. Some of the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have so far disregarded the holy commands of Jehovah as to intermarry with the surrounding peoples. They have taken of their daughters for themselves and for their sons. Ezra was told, so that the holy seed have mingled themselves with the people of heathen lands. Yea, the hand of princes and rulers have been chief in this trespass. In his, Ezra's study of the causes leading to the Babylonian captivity, Ezra had learned that Israel's apostasy was largely traceable to their mingling with the heathen nations. They went into Babylon because of the mystery of iniquity. And it was happening all over again when they came out of Babylon. Moving forward to Nehemiah. Yet striking evidence that the hand of the Lord was with Nehemiah was not sufficient to restrain discontent, rebellion, and treachery. In those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters to Tobiah, and letters to Tob of Le Tobiah came unto them. For there were many, and Judah sworn unto him, because he was the son-in-law of Shechaniah. Here are seen the evil results of intermarriage with idolaters. In this union, Satan had gained the victory. A family of Judah had connected themselves with the enemies of God, and the relation had proved a snare to the people. Many others also united in marriage with the heathen. These, like the mixed multitude that came up with Israel from Egypt, were a source of constant trouble. 
It's not simply me that's saying that this is line upon line here that we're looking at. Ellen White's tying this together for us. The mixed multitude is Tobiah, Gresham, Sambalat. They were not wholehearted in the service of God. When his work demanded a sacrifice, they were ready to violate their own oaths, solemn oaths of cooperation and support. All this had tended to weaken and discourage those who sought to build the cause of God. Now we're in the days of Christ. And we're close to finishing this up. You see how the mystery of iniquity is in each of these histories? And it's a subject of prophecy. And that the, the, what it produces is the tragedy of each of those histories. This is serious stuff. All need wisdom to carefully study out the mystery of iniquity, which plays such a large part in the closing scenes of this earth's history. Review and Herald, July 3rd, 1900. Christ gave to the world a lesson that should be engraved on mind and soul. This is eternal life, he said, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. But Satan works on human minds, saying, do this or that action, and ye shall be as gods. By deceptive reasoning. Now, what's deceptive reasoning? If I accidentally mislead you, that's not deceptive reasoning. It's just bad reasoning on my part, and bad reasoning on your part for, for believing it. Deceptive reasoning is purposely telling a lie. By deceptive reasoning, he led Adam and Eve to doubt God's word. Was that a purposeful action on Satan's part? It's deceptive reasoning. And to supply, in its, place, supply its place with a theory that led to transgression and disobedience. And his sophistry is doing today what it did in Eden. Oh, it's all happening again. When Christ came to our world, he selected humble fishermen as the foundation of his church. To these disciples, he tried to explain the nature of his kingdom and mission, but their limited comprehension imposed a restraint upon them. The d disciples couldn't get it. These were the chosen ones. These were the ones closest to Christ, and they couldn't get his message fully. But their limited comprehension imposed a restraint upon him. They had been receiving the sayings of the scribes and Pharisees. And therefore, much of what they believed was untrue. And though Christ had many things to say to them, they were unable to hear much of what he had longed to communicate. Now, if you remember, she's already described the Pharisees as the mixed multitude. Who's the scribes? What's a scribe? Brothers and sisters, a scribe's an author. And remember, what impacts us with the mystery of the iniquity at the end of the world is that there are books of a new order that are written. There's scribes in our day, just like there's Pharisees. Continuing on, Christ finds the religionists of this time. That's us. We're the religionists of this time. Christ finds the religionists of this time so full of erroneous sentiments that there's no room in their minds for the, for the truth. Hey, 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 you go share this prophetic message in Adventism. If you're teaching it on a regular ba basis in front of Seventh-day Adventists, you're spending a good portion of your time trying to explain the misconceptions that they hold upon, that they hold on to, that they were taught. Most people have never really, f f that I ran into, most lay people in Adventism have never on their own initiative studied out the daily, took it on their own personal responsibility and said, I'm going to understand what this means with my Bible and the spirit of prophecy and the Holy Spirit. When, when you present the daily, they're unsure maybe about what they believe or they may believe this or they may believe that, but it's all based on what they've been taught by other people. They're so full of erroneous sentiments that there is no room in their minds for truth. With the education given, it's from education, Teachers mingle the sentiments of infidel authors. Now here's a new twist. Not just bad education. It's taking books from authors that are infidels. Thus they've sown tares in the minds of the youth to give utterance to sentiments that should not be presented to young or old, never thinking of what kind of seed they are sowing or of the harvest they will have to garner as the result. Christ's Object Lessons, page 18, says this. In the days of Christ, these lessons had been lost sight of. Many had well nigh ceased to discern God and His works. 
the sinfulness of humanity had cast a pall over the face, fair face of creation, and instead of manifesting God, his works became a barrier that concealed him. Man worshipped and served the creature more than the creator. Thus the heathen became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. So in Israel, man's teaching had been put in the place of God's. Not only the things of nature, but the sacrificial service and the scriptures themselves, all given to reveal God, were so perverted that they became a means of concealing Him. So the characteristic so far is there's mingling, imitating the customs and manners of the heathen, returning to the old heathen superstitions. It happens little by little, creates this vain imagination. It's accomplished by intermarriage, the mixed multitude. They're impatient. They're foolish virgins that are motivated by fear and curiosity. They're half-hearted and superficial. They're Pharisees. They get weary of heaven's food due to a depraved appetite. And their work is accomplished when a new generation comes on the scene and begins to tear down the landmarks through deceptive reasoning that is accomplished by scribes that are putting man's teaching in the place of God's teaching. Those are the kind of characteristics of the mystery of iniquity. What about Luther? What about Martin Luther? Signs of the Times, July 19, 1893. The reformer continued searching the scriptures, praying, preaching, and writing. He knew not how soon his work might close, and he be deprived of liberty or even life, but so long as God should will it, he determined to labor for the upbuilding of Christ's kingdom. The knowledge that precious souls were everywhere receiving the truth filled him with joy. It was his work to build the temple of the Lord. It was Luther's work to build the temple of the Lord. That sounds like he's a type of Cyrus or a type of Miller, or Baptist, or Elijah, or Moses. It was his work to build the temple of the Lord. There were living stones buried from sight amid the papal rubbish of false doctrine, forms, and ceremonies, and he must search them out and lay them on, a, on the true foundation. The followers of Christ were not then united as a peculiar and holy people separate from the world. They were mingled with the sons of Belial and must be separated by the power of divine truth. So Martin Luther, he struggled with the mystery of iniquity also. Counsel to parents and teachers, parents, teachers, and students, page 424. We're almost done. We're, all, we're pretty good time. Cold philosophical speculations and scientific research in which God is not acknowledged is positive injury. And the evil is aggra aggravated when, as is often the case, books, books placed in the hands of the young, accepted as authority and depended upon in their education, are from authors avowedly infidel. Through all the thoughts presented by these men, their poisonous sentiments are interwoven. The study of such book is like handling black coals. A student cannot be undefiled in mind who thinks along the line of skepticism. The authors of these books, which have been sown, which have sown the seeds of doubt and infidelity broadcast over the world, have been under the training of the enemy of God and man, the God and man, the acknowledged head of principalities and powers, the ruler of the darkness of this world. The word of God has spoken concerning them. The word that God has spoken concerning them is, they became vain in their imagination. And their foolish heart was dark, and professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful. They rejected divine truth in its simplicity and purity for the wisdom of the world. Whenever books by these infidel authors are given the precedence, and the word of God is made secondary, there will be sent out of the schools a class of students no more better fitted for the service of God than they were before they received their education. Mystery of iniquity is accomplished through false education and through infidel books and through placing undue authority upon these, ascribing undue authority to these infidel authors. Today, Adventism. 
There are but two parties. Satan works with his crooked, deceiving power, and through strong delusions he catches all who will not abide in the truth and who have turned away their ears from the truth and have turned unto fables. How does he catch them? The mystery of iniquity. This is the mystery of iniquity. Satan himself, but bold not in the truth, he is the mystery of iniquity. Through his subtlety, he gives to the soul destroying he gives to his soul destroying errors the appearance of truth. Herein is the is their power to deceive. He doesn't just give us some kind of blatant error that we know is false. He gives us a blatant error that's covered with a little twist here and a little twist there, where in our Laodicean condition we actually think it might be true. Herein is their power to deceive. It is because they are a counterfeit of truth that spiritualism, theosophy, and the like deceptions gain such power over the minds of men. Herein is the masterly working of Satan. He pretends to be the savior of man, the benefactor of the human race, and thus he more readily lures his victims to destruction. We are warned in the word of God that sleepless vigilance is the price of safety. Only in the straight path of truth and righteousness can we escape the tempter's power, but the world is ensnared. Satan's skill is exercised in devising plans and methods without number to accomplish his purposes. Dissimulation. What in the world is dissimulation? Dissimulation has become a fine art. Whatever it is, Satan has perfected it and taught his followers to make it a fine art. Dissimulation has become a fine art with him, and he works in the guise of an angel of light. God's eyes alone discerns his scheme to contaminate the world with false and ruinous principles bearing on their face the appearance of genuine goodness. He works to restrict religious liberty and to bring into the religious world a species of slavery. Organizations, institutions, unless kept by the power of God, will work under Satan's dictation to bring men under the control of men, and fraud and guile will bear the semblance of a zeal for truth and for the advancement of the kingdom of God. Whatever in our practice is not as open as the day belongs to the methods of the prince of evil. There's a brother in, in Virginia that they recently, the church family recently disfellowshipped him over this message. And they made sure that when they had the, the church business meeting to disfellowship him, that they set the time for the meeting at the time of day when those people in the church family that would have provided some support and sympathy for this brother were at work and couldn't attend. Okay, those kind of deceptive practices, that's a mystery of iniquity. Whatever is our practice, whenever, whatever in our practice is not as open as the day, belongs to the methods of the Prince of Evil. His methods are practiced even among Seventh-day Adventists who claim to have advocated the truth, to, who claim to have advanced truth. If men resist the warnings the Lord sends them, they become even leaders in evil practices. Such men are to ex assumed, such men assume to exercise the prerogative of God's. They presume to do that which God himself will not do in seeking to control the minds of men. Will, will God use force? No. They will. Do, do you need to, this one to please put in your memory bank. Now, technically what they're doing here, they presume to do that which God himself will not do. What are they presuming to, who are they presuming to be? They're presuming to be God. But who's she talking about? Leaders in Adventism. So these, she says, are presuming to be God. And where are they setting? In the temple of God. Oh. In seeking to control the minds of men. They introduce their own methods and plans, and through their misconceptions of God, they weaken the faith of others in the truth and bring in false principles that will work like leaven. What's, what's leaven? It's little by little. They work like leaven to taint and to corrupt our institution and churches. Anything that lowers man's conception of righteousness and equity and impartial judgment, any device or precept that brings God's, 
human agents under the control of human minds impairs their faith in God. It separates the soul from God, for it leads away from the path of strict integrity and righteousness. God will not vindicate any device whereby, whereby man shall in the slightest degree rule, over, rule or oppress his fellow man. In the slightest degree. The only hope for fallen man is to look to Jesus and receive him as his only Savior as the only Savior. As soon as man begins to make an iron rule for other men, as soon as he begins to harness up and drive men according to his own mind, like the Newport Church says, not, o- not only do you not discuss the 2520 or the daily or the close of probation and Adventism in the church, don't do it in the privacy of your own home. Whoa. As soon as man begins to make an iron rule for other men, as soon as he begins to harness up and drive men according to his own man, mind, he dishonors God and imperils his own souls, soul and the souls of his brethren. Sinful man can find hope and righteousness only in God. And no human being is righteous any longer than he has faith in God and maintains the vital connection with him. A flower of the field must have its root in the soil. It must have air, dew, showers, and sunshine. It will flourish only as it receives these advantages, and all are from God. So with men, we receive from God that which ministers to the life of the soul. We are warned not to trust in man or to make flesh our arm. A curse is pronounced on all who do this. What is dissimulation? You have the dictionary definition on your next page. The act of dissembling, a hiding under false appearance. A feigning, false pretension, hypocrisy. Dissimulation may be simply concealment of the opinion, sentiments, or purpose, but it includes also the assuming of a false or counterfeit appearance, which conceals the real opinions or purpose. To dissemble means to hide under false appearance, to conceal, to disguise, to pretend that not which is not to be which really is, as I will not dissemble the truth. I cannot dissemble any dissemble my real sentiments. My point is, is these people that are promoting what we're defining as the mystery of iniquity, they become experts in the fine art of dissimulation, which is concealing and hiding things in order to accomplish your purposes. And Isaiah 28 says, these scornful men that rule Jerusalem they cover themselves under falsehood and lies. This is the scornful men which rule the people that are in Jerusalem. So now I'm going to take all these characteristics and turn them into a paragraph as we've reached our conclusion. The mixed multitude is the foolish virgins, the Pharisees, and the scribes at the end of the world in Adventism. The mixed multitude intermarries with the wise virgins and becomes vain in their imagination and returns to their old superstitions, customs, and manners. They join the Adventist church, but they return. They are impatient, half-hearted, and superficial and are motivated by fear and curiosity and soon become weary of heaven's food due to a depraved appetite. Little by little, they leaven the truth of the people of God, employing deception based upon their human reasoning, which they teach in place of God's word. They counterfeit the truth by dissimulation and promote their counterfeit through false education based upon infidel authorities and books in an attempt to control minds and tear down the old landmarks. This work begins in 1919 when a new generation arrives. Incredible that all these characteristics of the mystery of iniquity are just a a perfect fit for what Sister White describes as the Omega apostasy, which was premised on the Alpha apostasy, was it not? Sister White used the Alpha apostasy to describe the Omega apostasy, and when you take the characteristics of the mystery of iniquity line upon line through the proof text method in the scriptures, With Sister White's commentary, you see that the characteristics of the mystery of iniquity are describing the Omega apostasy to the very letter. What does the mystery of iniquity mean? Mystery, it's from a derivative of muo, a secret or a mystery. That's pretty easy, pretty straightforward. What about iniquity? Iniquity, Strong's 4558. It's from 4559. 
It means Ill illegality, that is, violation of the law. Iniquity is violation of the law, but it's, it's brought from the Strong's word. It's taken, derived from the strong words 459, which 459 is from G1. 459 means lawless, that is, not subject to law. Positively wicked. So iniquity, lawlessness, comes from a word that means positively wicked, but that comes from two words. G1, the one word that makes this word iniquity is G1. This is the, the first part of iniquity. It says, of Hebrew origin, the first letter of the alphabet. Alpha. The first part of iniquity is alpha. But it comes from another word, 3551, which, from a primary word, Nemo, to parcel out. To parcel out? The mystery of iniquity is the alpha apostasy, and the mystery of iniquity is accomplished by parceling out. How was it that, that Satan accomplished the rebellion in heaven? Did he go bring all the angels together and say, hey, this is what I believe? No. He parceled out a little thought here and a little thought there. A leavening process, little by little, is the mystery of iniquity. Now, of course, the mystery of iniquity, where's the primary reference to the mystery of iniquity in God's Word? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And tomorrow we'll look more specifically at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Lord willing. But I hope Brothers and sisters, you see that one of the waymarks in every reform line is this mystery of iniquity. And to think that this characteristic that's in every reform line isn't designed by God to teach us what we're dealing with in Adventism today is to demonstrate a mind that has become vain in its imagination. This is a present, true, serious understanding that we need to understand. Shall we pray? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we wish to shake off the, the darkness that is preventing us from being fully used by you. We ask that you'd give us the, the discernment to see the, the sources of information that we're following, the, the books that we're reading that should be thrown away and burned the televisions that we're watching, the DVDs that we're watching, the websites we're visiting, any of these places that is providing a mixture of truth and error or just blatant error, we ask that you give us the discernment to see that this is Satan's tool to turn us into a wise, uh, from a wise virgin to a foolish virgin, to turn us into a Pharisee and a scribe to secure us as a mixed multitude as we approach the Sunday Law crisis. We wish to be clean. We wish to be pure vessels for the Lord that we might receive the golden oil that you're pouring out. But we have a responsibility to understand that Satan is working to destroy us. And we have a responsibility to understand that you have been clear about how the technique that he uses to do this. This leavening process that he presents a little here, a little there, from unholy sources. Please give us the discernment and the willingness to turn away from this kind of information that we might be solidly standing upon your word when this shaking arrives in the near future. In Jesus' name, amen.